things go where the fires are high and the candles glow. Take me down to the magical place where the dancing and swaying at a feverish pace. Take me away on a mystical ride, moving through the layer to the other side. Fill me up with spirit songs of power and love's alive. Take me down where the pagans go where the fires are high and the candles glow. Take me down to the magical place where they're dancing and swaying at a feverish pace. Take me away on a mystical ride, moving through the veil to the other side. Fill me up with the spirit songs of power and love's alive. Take me down through the seven gates where I'll cast my being to the hands of fate. Take me down to the dragon's lair where myth and legend ride the air. Let me rise on the messenger's wings. Let me see what the future brings. Fill me up with the spirit songs of power and love's alive. Take me down with the pagans. I am Reverend Alicia Lyon Fulbert. And I'm Iris Chaussey. And welcome to another edition of Keepers of the Flame. Uh, this is a Pantheon Temple show. And this is part two that we are continuing of what Wiccans do um, to educate people out there, because you're probably not very familiar with a lot of our practices. Um, today we have uh, an altar set up, very kind of loose altar set up. Um, just primarily just so that we have some of the, the tools and items here so that people will become more familiar with them. It's uh, not a full uh, formal altar. But, um, Iris, so when you first started coming to the Pantheon Temple, yes. <laughs> yeah, you, you started, uh, when you first saw the altar, what were some of the things that you noticed? That I noticed. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Athane. Okay. Because I wasn't really sure what the purpose right. of it was. Yeah, the Athame. Um, just so you can see that. Yeah, that is uh, an altar tool. We use that in circle. Yeah, there we go. And this one is actually, uh, it's it, it, there's nothing... Well, very custom about it. This is just a, a simple store-bought piece. It doesn't have uh, any particular writings or anything or, or like that on it. There's nothing terribly traditional about it, except for the fact it's got a black handle and it's got a double edge. And Athami, you know, it, we use that in circle for actually casting the circle, actually use it for commanding the elements, and, you know, we also use it in the the wine blessing, uh, when we actually join the, the chalice and, and the blade together. Usually the, the priest and priestess do that. I did not know that until I started. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So the first time I seen that, I was really, I was a little confused. But now I understand. Yeah, it, it was actually kind mm -hmm. of funny. Um, we, we had somebody come by before, and, and they were just, you know, I, I think a little concerned. They, they said, you know, are you sacrificing anything? And I, my answer is, as always, we love, sacrifice love, time, and energy. Um, sometimes you might see flowers on an altar if you want to consider that an offering because they're cut. You know, that, that I think that's about as close as we ever get to, to anything that's, that's living. Yeah. Just so that everybody's clear, you know, that we, we don't do things like that in, in Wicca. Um, and I myself am vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> So it's always very confusing to me when people, they think that they've seen like some kind of like B-grade horror movie or something and think that that's real. I don't know how anybody could think, you know, yeah, TV so. is real, but people do. Um, we also, too, have a small chalice. It's just black glass. Uh, this is actually, there's nothing terribly magical about this either. This is an old Victorian piece. I actually bought this one off of eBay. <laughs> It's just very pretty. Um, you know, that's really kind of the forerunner of this object right here. That is the cauldron. Yeah, they're both feminine objects. And, you know, the chalice is used to actually hold the, the sacred wine, or in some cases for a lot of our public circles, the sacred juice. Um, so we use uh, pomegranate juice lots of times as a substitute uh, for the wine in public circle, just simply because it is public circle. And we understand that there are people that might be recovering. Uh, so we, 
we might stay away from that, aside from the fact that usually in public places it's not a very cool thing to actually bring in alcohol. Um, the cauldron is a little different. The cauldron we can actually um, do some more things with. Uh, it's actually set up in a position where it could potentially be a libation bolt, but that isn't really its purpose here. Uh, it could be filled with water. It could be used for scrying yeah, as a tool for divination. It could be used to actually hold something that was burning. Um, you know, for the most part, I, I think it's always kind of funny that they always show witches with the cauldron very Macbeth, you know, and uh, I really, truly, you know, I have never, ever in my entire time of being pagan or Wiccan have I ever brewed anything in a cauldron. <laughs> Although I really make an awesome um, black bean soup. So that's, I think, about as close as I get, and I, I can use cast iron for that. Um, bells. Yeah, we ha I have another set of tinctures here. I'm going to ring these because they sound really, really pretty. I like those. Yeah. Just awesome. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes what we do is we often borrow things, even sometimes from other traditions, other religions, and, you know, we might actually be using those in circle. I think of being American, American Wiccans or American witches, a lot of people do a lot of very eclectic things, you know, things that a lot of people maybe who are in other traditions in other countries might not think of. It's, it, it's something, because America is such a, a melting pot. Yes, yes it is. You know, um, where it's, it's not actually a, even really appropriation um, because I'm, I'm not into native appropriation, but people use smudging, you know, they will use white sage in a, in a circle for purification. Obviously that's not Wiccan. Um, you know, in, in Wiccan we might do things like using, uh, an anointing oil. And, you know, then of course there's African kind of based drumming, although I, I have to say it's very loose. When we have drum circles, they're very loosely based on, uh, not professional. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, drums are drums are great for for holding energy. They're yes. they're great for keeping a, a ritual going and keeping people focused. And I think for large public ceremonies, they're absolutely wonderful. But again, that isn't something you know traditionally that Wiccans would do. This is something that that being Americans, we just keep absorbing, kind of every little thing that comes our way. And, there, you know, just to make it even more um, confusing, there's a lot of differences between traditional craft and, I think, more eclectic Wiccan traditions. Uh, we're kind of in the, this little strange place for, for us for the Pantheon Temple because although Edesian is based on traditional craft, it still has things like public circles. They could be in a variety of, of different traditions, even within the Wiccan Church of Canada even though that Odysseus is the tradition of the priesthood. So this is kind of a loose kind of uh, Odysseus setup. There's a few things that are missing from it, like a, a source candle in the center. Um, that was kind of a, an overthought for me. We, we held ceremony last night, and there were just a few things that I forgot that I didn't actually bring out today. Um, you know, so when we have the altar set up, I don't think that a lot of people even... Um, would recognize the fact that we have a reason for doing everything. Yes, yes. And you, you know a little bit about, you know, why the altar is set up the way it is. I know very little. <laughs> well, we were talking about that the other night, that we yes. have, what, the, the feminine? The feminine. Or, or the, the goddess. form? Yes. Right, and we have force on the other side? Yes. Mostly masculine. So we have form and force. Now that might sound strange, but you know, if you, you're going, um, in order of like what came before what, like we would have the source candle here that would be lit first. That's the place of creation where everything came from the Big Bang, if you will. It's a black pillar candle. Normally these would be black. I just, uh, I happen to have red ones rather <laughs> than black ones today. Uh, so uh, th these are a substitute color right here. So we would have form. Form came after 
and then we have force, which followed. You think of that as being like energy and the spark. And then, then the gods came. We have the goddess and then the god. So those candles actually would be lit in, in that order, in the order of actual creation. Um, again, you know, we're, we're very earth honoring anyway. I just like to, to show this. This is, this is my own little private treasure. Yeah, this is a deer antler. You'll notice something very important. It is naturally shed. Okay, this was not taken off an animal. I actually found this on a path that I used to walk on when I was actually living back in North Salem, New York. And uh, I was lucky enough to get one because, you know, squirrels and chipmunks and things, they usually get these as a source of calcium, and they, they abscond with them mm. before, you know, we even have a chance to get them. How many them. years have you, have you had those antlers? Oh, gosh, I had that antler for... I think I found this when I was 14 or 15. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. It's really become a part of you now. Well, it has, but, you know, at the same point, you know, um, there's a little bit of, you know, my own beliefs that are kind of overflowing into that. You know, in, in Native traditions, it's, it's very appropriate to have something, like if you have a sacred object, that's something that's discarded that wasn't actually taken from something. Yes. You know, like even if somebody had something like a sacred, like a, a turtle rattle, you know, you wouldn't want to kill the turtle. You know, you would want to take a shell that had already been abandoned where the, the turtle had, had passed away from whatever causes. Because once that, you know, animal has passed on, then, you know, whatever is left, you may freely take. So it didn't cost anything, anybody, its life at all. Um, you can have another little piece over here. This of, yeah, sure. That's a, that's another old piece that I've had with me for an, uh, forever. It's an abalone shell. And that can be used as uh, a dish to hold the water. And, you know, it can also be used as a symbol for the goddess on the altar, just the same way that I have the, the antler right here. So these are very, you know, natural objects that we have. Uh, we also have the incense. Incense is also an offering. Uh, I have a little piece within a piece. And this, I have the, the charcoal briquette here. We use those just the same way that you may have seen them in, in churches and even things like a little bit of incense, a little bit of resin incense, frankincense and myrrh, and there's like some lavender and things in there. Um, so that would also be the element of air. And we have a salt dish also too over there, something to hold the salt. And, uh, you know, different traditions have different ways of, of doing things. In the Decian tradition, we actually have the four elements present on the altar, and we use that as, as an elemental purification of the circle. This one's the earth. Yeah. And uh, normally there'd be a little fire candle. I, I think I forgot to take that out of the basket. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we would have air and fire and earth and water. We have the four alchemical elements, which make up what? The, the, four, the four chemical elements that make up... Spirit. Yes. Yes. Yeah, which uh, also brings us to our Peyton right here. We have a pentacle. And, you know, this is just, this is, again, this is, this is just very plain... Uh, you know, people, they get all bent out of shape over the stars. But, you know, what it really is, is that you have five points. And maybe I'll just hold it up again. Well, we keep holding it up. Yeah, you, you can hold that up. There we go. Um, a little bit lower so people could see it. Okay, now the, the point on the top is spirit. Now, spirit actually rules over the four elements. And there is air and... I'm backwards, so it's hard to see. Right here, and air. <laughs> Right here, that was that's water. We have fire, fire. Earth, earth, and air. air. Right. And so, you know, just to take some of that mystery out of it, you know, um, even though it can be shown upside down without it actually being satanic, that would actually be for second degree initiation, which is its own thing. And then at that point, it also symbolizes the underworld journey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't, have things, you know, that, that are re representing anything that's bad on our altar. Everything is sacred. Everything that we do is sacred. 
And so our tools are sacred. They're not profane. Um, things are consecrated. You know, items are consecrated. And, you know, we, we treat them as, as sacred objects. Just even like the athami. The athami that I have. Um, some people, they, they get those silly ideas over the movies again. And, you know, when you have an athami, you're using this between the worlds. You know, you're, you're actually entering the realm of spirit, and you most certainly would never want to harm anything with it. You most certainly wouldn't want to use this for cutting, you know, mundane objects, you, you know. So, that, that still is a, is a sacred tool. So, you wouldn't, uh, ever dream of, of, of using that for, like, in your kitchen. You most no. certainly wouldn't be. Not even for your herbs, for your altar. No, nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Which is, I actually have a small, small bowling, and uh, I didn't bring that out today. But I do have my herbal one. It doesn't have a white handle. It's just really, it's just really, it's a small sickle, a small herbal harvesting sickle. Um, you know, the bowling is normally one of the few tools that's used outside of circle, just for, let's say, like cutting the herbs. Um, and it would have a white handle. The small one I have is, is more appropriate for doing things like inscribing candles. You know, it's meant to be used on, on the altar, you know, as opposed to using something really, really sharp to cut herbs with. So, and let's see. You have your wand? We have the wand. Yeah, the wand is used in, in certain ceremonies. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a masculine kind of looking object, and, and it is. You know, we actually have the, you know, that form and force going on with the altar, and then we also have the place in between where we would normally have the libation bowl that would be honoring both. And so we have the, the altar tool correspondences also go with that as well, just like air and fire. Those are actually seen as being masculine, and then we have water and earth, and those are seen as being feminine. Um, in addition to that, we actually have three planes on the altar. We have the physical plane, and that's where the, the real working tools are. We have the mental plane, which is kind of the, the middle area going across. And that is more, you know, your elemental tools and such. And uh, also, too, things like the libation bowl would be in the center. And then we have the spiritual plane. That would be all the way in the back. This is this little layer here with the candles. And it would have any deity representations. Those are just strictly symbolic. So they're not actual physical working tools on that spiritual uh, back half of the altar. Uh, you know, when we actually do circle, you know, what we're doing in some small sense is we are enacting, reenacting the cosmos. And we, we are asking for change. And I, I think that's where a lot of people get kind of messed up. Because they, they're they always assuming that, you know, we must be doing something terribly mysterious in our rituals and arcane and... <laughs> There's a reason why every there part is. is done from beginning to the very end. There is. And, you know, there, there's a tremendous amount of, of ritual that is actually done in setting up the circle and going between the worlds and enacting that change. It, to, to really understand it, I think we, you really have to understand that we see ourselves as being co-creators with our universe. We're not seeing ourselves as being passive and just asking for things. We're actually working with those forces. Um, and we are asking as well that these things come about, but we're being very active in, in creating that change for ourselves and for other people. And, you know, when we actually do circle, we're honoring something, somehow. It's usually not just, you know, we decided to get together and, you know. I, th I think the movie, in my opinion, The Craft, uh, has done more damage. <laughs> To what people think that we do. And for the longest time I had people who were, you know, emailing me and stuff and wanted to know about summoning the spirit. And I'm like, which spirit? <laughs> it does not even work like uh, that. Oh, it yeah. doesn't. It doesn't. You know, everything is, is, is a sacred act. And we do actually work with our, our deities in a lot of traditions, uh, a DCN too. We 
work uh, with them in such a way that we actually call them into our circles. Now this isn't, you know, you shall appear kind of stuff that you might see on TV. We're asking very nicely. Um, these are our deities that we're working with. You know, this is a, this is a sacred act, you know, because we're actually working with them. We're acting as their hands. We're acting as their voices. You know, we let them move through us. And sometimes that actually takes the form of truly invoking our deities and having, you know, those deities spiritually become a part of us yes, for a little while. Yes, as a very close relationship. Yes. You're not just calling them, you end up having a love and right. respect. And right. being a part of us. And, you know, it, it's, it's done in a sacred way. But, it, you know, again, too, it, it's not for people who I think are really uh, faint of heart. And it's most certainly not for people who aren't interested in being honest with themselves. Because, you know, there's a, there's a level of integrity um, that is really kind of demanded out of us, you know, by our deities, by what we do, by, by the magic that we work. So, you know, it, until we're really solid inside ourselves, we really can't do this magical work. And our deities, chances are they won't, no matter how many times we call them, they're not going to come down for us until everything is right. Yes. Um, I've, I've done rituals before where, you know, somebody's energy was, was very off. And I don't think their heart was in the right place. And so, therefore... No, no one, no, nothing came. And I think that was very, you know, disappointing. I remember before, um, when I first yeah. started, I remember at the beginning, it was almost you're just doing the act. You're just doing the act for whatever you read in the book or right. whatever you've seen, it, but right. it doesn't end up being a part of you. So nothing's coming out of it. You're just doing it and saying it just because that's what you think you're supposed to do till you fall in love with, you know, your deity or or whoever you're calling, it doesn't take on the energy and form that you should in the in the circle. Right, right. Yeah, it, the, that's absolutely true. Yes. What, what I get out of circle now is nothing that I got of a couple years ago. I just did it just because that's what you're supposed to do, I guess. And it, <laughs> you can't just do the act and expect something to come out of it. No, no. And so, and so, we, so we work very hard on establishing those relationships with, with our deities. And, you know, there are times, though, that are absolutely beautiful. Uh, like we just celebrated in bulk, and that celebrates the goddess Bridget. And she's a really lovely goddess to work with. And there's one chant that we did, and it was so amazing when we all fell into sync and our heart was in the right place. We were all asking her for healing for ourselves, for family members and other loved ones. And that chant reverberated. You could hear it bouncing across the room from you know, from voice to voice. And then all of a sudden there was almost like this thrum that happened in the ritual. And I realized that everything had shifted and everything had changed. And yes, there was a presence there. Mm -hmm. And yes, you know, somebody was listening to those things so, so that those requests could be answered. There are times when it's just so beautiful and it's pure magic. I think that's really what draws us in. Once we get to that place, that experience, it's so life-changing to not see the divine as separate, to see it as part of ourselves, to see it as, as so imminent. You know, I, I think that that is where a lot of us make the shift, where a lot, where before we may not have, a, I mean, maybe we were reading something from a book or what have you, it just it didn't that's resonate. How it, that's how it started out with me, from yeah. a book. You can't find, you can learn a lot from books. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. No, we recommend lots and lots of reading. That's how you learn. But you, you don't, ex you don't know until you experience and feel it. Yeah. There, there was a little argument that somebody was having the other day. They were talking about advanced Wicca, which I thought was kind of a, well, a little ironic because, you know, there will never be a book truly on advanced Wicca. I don't care what book of shadows you put out there. Mm -hmm. This is it. When you practice, this is the advanced part. The connection that you make, you know, working with the elements, working with the divine. That's the advanced part. Learning how to work with all of that. Um, 
everything takes on such a, a different view when you actually really start working with it. I'm not sure I can really truly put that into words, and I know I'm hesitating, but I'm not. I'm not even you finding the words. It, you can't, there's no words for no, it. No, no. You cannot find the energy in in no in a book. There's you cannot until you get there and experience it. It's nothing. It's not even. I can't even explain it. There's no words for it. Yeah, and you know, it's just it. It's something. It's almost like it. It touches a song within your heart. You know. Yes, that's true. And you know, you feel it on a on a very deep level. So you know, we we're, we're we're having these these wonderful little tools out on our altar. You know, it, it's not done, of course. You know, willy nilly. It's it's done as a deliberate act. Uh, the incense, let's just say, would be particular to that deity or to that ritual, maybe that mm-hmm. time of year, the Sabbath, um, whatever it is that we're actually working with. You know, um, so, you know, a lot of things do ch- might actually change on the altar. We might have different symbols on the altar. We might have little different deity representations on the altar. There's a whole lot of variety that we're likely to have. Like the last time when we were discussing the Sabbaths, you know, um, things like, you know, for Yule, we might have a Yule log on the altar. And I do have one that has five perfectly drilled holes on it. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually fits across the back. Um, so, you know, there, there's a, there's a lot of variety that we have. Uh, another thing too about our, our altar, tools, um, even if it's just something like a, a candlestick. Now, I'm just going to move this forward a little bit just so I can show it to the camera. And this is my own personal piece. Um, the person that I was with at the time was very much in shock that I went and uh, I actually just plain forked over the money for these things. Um, they were quite expensive. They were in an antique store. They're bronze, and I just had to have them because they're a sphinx, and because they're a sphinx, they actually embody the four elements. And I knew that I was never going to find another pair like that, so I, I didn't question it. My altar tools are probably the one thing that I'll, you know, like books, that I will just not think twice about, that if I actually have the money for, I will spend it on, you know, these items. And they are sacred because, you know, one of the things that we can't do either is we can't actually haggle down the price on our sacred items because we can't devalue that. So my friend was even more shocked that I didn't even try and haggle. And I'm like, I can't. (laughs) (laughs) I'm taking these home. These are the, this is for my altar. If it's perfect and you have to, you know, that's it. That's right. Yeah. You know, a Mm -hmm. lot of us, we we start out with with very um, simple objects. My, my very first athami was a, a letter opener, you know, and uh, it, it had a nice edge on it. <laughs> it was made in Japan. <laughs> and, you know, I had these little things because that was all I could really afford at the time. I mean, even something as simple as a marble you can scry with. So, you know, uh, lots of times people will start out with very simple objects, mm-hmm. you know, when they're first, uh, beginning and then, you know, they realize that maybe they can, they can get something else. Uh, you know, I've had a kind of an evolving altar over the years. There are things that has, that we have for the temple and there's things that I have for me. Sometimes they overlap, not always. And I'm always on the lookout for something really nice for circle. Um, you know, something that, that has a practical use within, let's say, like a Sabbath specifically, because there are little things that we might want to do for the Sabbaths. I mean, we might not do it any other time of year. I have a, a bowl that's actually just for burning candles in, because um, it, it has a nice, uh, mostly flat bottom to it that we can actually stand the candles, and that's for in bulk. You know, we, when we light our candles and we, we lit them as an offering and we we'll watch them all burn down as one, it was uh, really quite lovely, but you know, I, I had to go out and I had to buy that most specific piece so that we could do that specific <laughs> ritual. Um, so, you know, we might, depending on what we're doing, you know, if we have things like public circles, you know, th- there might be a lot of stuff that you have. And uh, I will say that running a temple, I've ended up with a lot of stuff. <laughs> 
Um, it doesn't have to be, nothing has to be expensive. Um, like I mentioned, I, I found the, the chalice on, on eBay. I have a, a lovely one at home that's uh, carnival glass. It's oak, it's oak leaves and it's green and it's very pretty. I have a matching candy dish, which serves as a libation bowl. They're both very pretty together. People most certainly wouldn't think about it in terms of, oh, well, that's just a water chalice and that's just a candy dish. <laughs> so it's sitting on an altar at home. Somebody comes over, not going to think twice. They're not even going to no, realize it's an altar. No, you know, lots of times, you know, we might even have our altars out. People might not even know what they really are. I mean, for myself, I have a, a picture of uh, of Waterhouse's work called The Accolade, and it's a, it's a queen. She's, she's knighting someone in front of her. And that's really for my goddess Rhiannon because she is the great queen. So, you know, she's sitting above my altar and people would say, oh, gee, that's a lovely, beautiful painting. Yeah, Oh, that's pre-Raphaelite, isn't it? <laughs> well, yes, it is. <laughs> but that isn't really its purpose, you know. Um, it, it's, it, you know, a lot of things are also too come from very much common everyday items. Um, like I, don't, I don't have one with me right now, but the, the broom, the, the, the besom. Um, would be, let's say, like traditionally made with a, a birch brush and a, a ash handle and wrapped with willow. But, you know, when we use that in circle, we're using that to actually sweep away negativity things, you know, that we may not want in circle, so we're using it actually to purify. And that's a very simple tool when it comes right down to it. Because a lot of this, you know, originally was based on folk magic, and there's an element of ceremonial magic that got mixed into it, too. Obviously, a, a cauldron, people back in the day wouldn't have a special cauldron for things. You'd only have one pot. That's all you could afford would be one yes. pot. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, a wand is actually from ceremonial magic, and, you know, that that really doesn't, have anything that corresponds truly to folk magic unless you're talking about a staff. And there, there are different kinds of woods that are seen to have different kinds of properties uh, as a staff. Uh, they, they actually refer to uh, blackthorn as being a blasting staff. So, you know, er everything has its own lore that's associated with it. For an athami, you know, a knife once upon a time, you know, these were very expensive, expensive items to get something, you know, that was hand forged. Oh my goodness, that, that would probably cost somebody so much money. Um, but now we have the modern manufacturing methods and they're very inexpensive. This was actually a rather inexpensive piece, even though it's a, it's a heavier weight and I think a little bit nicer a piece than, um, standard. It's, it's Celtic in design. And, you know, a sword, uh, a sword is really more ceremonial magic too, you know, because that corresponds with the, uh, the athami. And you would want to use it to cast a circle with also too as well, which may not always be practical depending on, you know, where you're actually holding your circle. But yes, at one time only nobility could carry a sword, so, you know. You know, somebody would have to be very wealthy to have something like that. So that would be something that your common, everyday folk witch would have. <laughs> so things would be very simple. They'd be very plain. They would be, you know, pretty much unadorned. And, you know, even if uh, there was a lot of care in things, because obviously people had uh, a lot of care in their, their personal items, you know, we have to understand, too, that, that at one time, even somebody who had a spinning wheel, just a spinning wheel, may have been thought of as being very rich. So we don't realize, in some sense, how wealthy Take we a lot are. Of things, yeah, for granted. Yeah, we do. Um, I spent a lot of years in the SCA, and I, I think, in, a, in some sense, I'm very glad I did that because it, it made me pay more attention to history. And true, we're, we were doing reenactment, it was effectively living history. But I explored more. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, I, I think I have a deeper appreciation for even, like, the things that, that we actually have. So, uh, you know, even even things, you know, like be it the candlesticks, whatever, you know, these are, these are all items that we're going to want to make sure are, are sacred, that they aren't just, you know, for everyday use, unlike somebody would have done back in the day. We actually have our items that are just... Mm -hmm 
specifically for sacred use. Some people make their own too. Yes, they do. Make their own items. Yes, they yes. do. You know, and I, I think there's really something with that too that you have. We put a lot of your own personal energy into the items. Um, something like Smith crafting though metal that that now that's a gift. Uh, yeah, that's not <laughs> something the average anymore. person can do. <laughs> no. There there is a, a kind of an outline in, in Ray Bookland's book for his uh, uh, Say Axe Wick of which actually was was mail order uh, classes originally put together in a book. And he talks about taking a file, and he's talking about hand hammering the file. And you know, somebody told me she's like, "Well, I tried that, but it broke." And I'm like, "I'm not surprised. It's the wrong kind of metal." Yeah. <laughs> so you know that that is truly an art to be able to smith craft steel. Truly, is an art that isn't something that everybody can do. Um, you know, some things like a wand. I made my own wand. Uh, it may be made with you know copper. Uh, piping and it's got a quartz crystal and some suede and some wire but I did actually hand make that yeah you can see that that's very pretty yeah so I I use that for circle don't you feel like it comes a part of you with that energy yeah it, it kind of does you know so the, the, a lot of people when you pick out things you're looking for something that's gonna you know resonate with you just in the same way that, you know, people would buy something like their favorite birthstone or what have you. You know, we're looking for things that resonate with us and our personalities. And So what do you think about somebody going near your altar and touching your altar? Some people are really a step away. It's a working altar Well, that's a big, table. big no-no. Yes, yes, yes. You know, you know, <laughs> for, for a lot of people that are new, this is a, a big learning experience because you're entering into effectively a culture when you, you enter into paganism and Wicca. And they would, you know, come over and they might just say, oh, look at that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is sacred. This is not for everybody to touch. Yes, this yeah. is not show and tell. Um, it, it, these items are put specifically on the altar for a reason. By the same point, you don't walk over and you don't put your soda cup on the altar. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's sacred. You know, even the altar cloth. I, I know we have this lovely designed uh, altar cloth. Um, again, it's Celtic. You know, hey, this is what I do. And uh, But traditionally, it would be black. I mean, solid black. And, you know, that, that again is just like the source candle. It's, it's representing the universe, everything that, that everything else sprang from. You know, the, the darkness, the void. So, yeah, I want to make sure I pointed that out, you know, about not touching people's things. Just I in case know. you go to somebody's house, you're not, you know. I know. It, it's so strange that, you know, when you go over to somebody's house, you know you're not like a little kid. You're not supposed to be picking up stuff and just saying, oh, what's that? You know, you don't want to do that with people's yes. things. You ask. <laughs> and a lot of people, I guess, they figure because, you know, it, it's ceremony that somehow but it's But you different. have your own your altar your own yes. tools yes. compared to what you have for public right you know yeah so i you know usually keep a lot of things just aside just for myself i might break them out for a public ceremony if i have a most particular ritual that i need to work our temple has never been so wealthy that i can say oh the temple will just have all these altar tools and i'll never have to use any of my own so there's always been, you know, that element where I have to use something yes. of my own in there. And if I want to purify it afterwards, you know, that's up to me. Um, but usually I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with that. What other things can you think of that some, somebody might want to know? Coming, to understand a little bit more? Yeah, coming in new. Um, Probably more of, of the reasoning why you would burn incense. I don't think people would understand that. That's true. That's true. Um, incense on the altar uh, is a kind of a twofold purpose. It's it's the element of air, and we do use that in circle. Um, we can see. I actually converted over a, a small dish. Yeah, this is another one of my antique shop finds. And, you know, you can I can actually swing this around the circle. I can put the incense on it, and I can burn that, and I can purify the circle with that. Um, and, you know, it, it's offerings to deities as well on the altar. 
Um, so, you know, if you see somebody's altar and they've always got a little bit of incense going, it's, you know, chances are it may have a purpose. But also, too, it may be an offering, like uh, for Rhiannon, uh, she likes roses. So I like to burn rose incense. Um, and it turns out that the stuff that they make in India just happens to truly smell like roses. It's very nice stuff. <laughs> so that's what I look for. You know, I, I go out of my way and I try and find the stuff that she would like. And, you know, a lot of us do that. Um, you know, different things are very specific to different deities. So, you know, depending on how we're honoring them, you know, we, we're going to want to take something and, and uh, do a correspondence, if you will, for that. There are also symbols and other things that, you know, different deities have correspondences with, like Rhiannon's also, too, is the horse, and also birds. So, you know, there might be something with, like, horses on it or birds, and, and if it's not out today, but I'll have, like, that green altar cloth, um, how uh, that I usually do when we have the show. I actually do my tarot readings on that. And it has, you know, three horses on it. And, you know, that's kind of honoring her whenever I, I do my readings and things. So, What about more about the bell? What's the purpose for the bell? Okay, purpose for the bell. This is used as punctuation for ritual. It's also used for sometimes summoning a spirit or deity. You know, I'll actually, I ring these at Samhain when we call on the, the spirits of those that have passed on, and we call them actually into circle. Again, this is a sacred act. I'll also tell you that this lovely little sound also gets everybody into a ritual mindset the second that we begin. That is very true. That is very you true. know, a lot of this is also too psychological, mm -hmm. you know. So we use, you know, these these tools also too in a psychological way to to bring about, about that change. I, I noticed on public ritual you'll have us do a chant. Yes. For a, quite a while, to everybody gets into that, gets that same energy going. Yes. So everybody's in sync. That's that's very yes. important. You know, that, that's also too a, a part of. Uh, ritual mindset, the group mindset, is that, you know, chants are, are not something that's scary either. You know, chants are honoring, you know, just a, as much as anybody would go to church and they would sing a hymn, we're singing too. We're, we're singing to our deities. And, you know, sometimes we, we use that to focus energy, like for casting a circle or sometimes calling the elements. And... Um, there's nothing terribly mysterious about that. It's just it's it's incredibly pretty, you know, when we when we sing different things. Chants though end up being repetitive, so you know, we fall into a kind of a meditative kind of state when we do that. Mm -hmm. Again, that's psychological, you know. We we do the ritual, so I think that that's another place where we deviate a bit because we're we are looking for the psychological aspects as well. Even incense has a psychological component. You know, the different senses uh, mm -hmm. that we have, uh, the sight and smell and all that, they play a big role in ritual. So when we are burning incense, let's just say I was burning rose incense, you know, obviously that's going to have an effect on us when mm -hmm. we smell it. You know, that's going to have an emotional reaction. So, you know, all these things combine to, for us to actually uh, focus our mental energy, if you will, on creating things. That's why you explained at the beginning why every piece that you use, there's a purpose, there's a reasoning. Yes. So it's not just the incense you're burning to call the element of air. It's also what kind of incense you're using for that ritual. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, just, uh, I just gave you my, uh, my little plant last yes, night. Yes, you did. The oxalis. Yes. Yeah, my shamrocks. I like shamrocks. Um, They're very I, cool. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had them for, for quite some time. I, it's one of the plants that I, I like to keep in front of my kitchen window. And one of the nice things about it is that it's actually really the first plant that flowers for me. And unfailingly, it does flower um, before in bulk actually occurs. And I, I actually have a little uh, formula for some incense, and one of the ingredients is the first flowers of spring. 
So I always have the first flowers of spring because I have the shamrock. And I pointed it out yesterday. I'm like, is there flowers <laughs> on there? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was really surprised. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's also it's a plant that isn't from New England. You know, yes. I mean, although my I've, I've got a couple of other things that are that are starting to to bloom and everything because they are inside a nice warm kitchen. But you know, it's nice to have that there. Yes, very nice to have that there. Um, let's see. Ah, other idea, other things for ritual. Yeah, this is this is actually something we just only talked about this the other night, and uh, you know, we didn't actually rehearse this or anything. I've just been doing this like forever, so I, I yak about this in, in class, and I, I tell everybody what it is that we're actually doing with with what. Oh well, we can explain that the reason why you have all the elements on the table too is because yeah. you use them the the call yes. at the beginning. Yes. Yeah, we actually, um, yeah, we have a, a couple of, we have a series of things that happen in circle. One of the first things that we do, obviously we call people to circle. Uh, we anoint, you know, that's a form of purification. Uh, we also to, uh, cast the circle, you know, with the athami or the sword. Uh, after we cast the circle with that, because we're, we're using that to go between the worlds. Um, that that's the first act, and that is actually done in the same three planes that we have uh, with our altar. We do it on the physical, the mental, and the spiritual plane. And then we take the broom, the besom, and we sweep the circle, and that's for purification. And after that comes the elemental purification. Now, some traditions, what they do is they mix the salt and the water together. And they will asperge, which is which is kind of interesting because uh, traditionally um, we don't have earth anymore; it's dissolved. <laughs> <laughs> but I can understand how that yeah, works. Yeah, you know, sometimes uh, people will use things like flowers to asperge with, but but traditionally it's wine, you know, or some some form of libation that you're actually as- asperging with. Um, you know that that's outside, of course, Wiccan tradition. But you know, it's it's interesting to see how we the traditions overlap. We have one thing that we don't have on our table that you yeah. usually would have an altar is offering. Well, yeah, that's kind of the position where the cauldron is right now. Yes, I don't have yeah. the libation bowl on the altar. Um, you know, when you get all this stuff together, uh, if you're trying to have all the items, and I do mean all the items, on the altar. All at once. Well, I didn't explain myself. Wow. I meant the cakes and <laughs> ale, and we leave some oh, as an offering okay. at the end. I yeah, didn't explain do. myself. Yes. Oh, that's all right. So usually would have. Um, yes. We would have some kind yeah. of cake or something. Yeah, and sometimes we have it on a on a side table. You yes. Know? Sometimes yes. it's underneath. Um. But you know, we, when we do the the purification, we we do the air. You know, we go around with the incense once, we go around with the fire once, we go around the water once, we go around the salt once. Uh, we actually call in the elements. Uh, we actually uh, don't see them as being something that, that resonates the same way the deity does, so we actually command them into circle. And that they're, they're actually like a, a lower f- spiritual form than we are. Um, so that's the reason why we command them and that would actually be effectively the the corners of our circle if you will uh, we have four uh, watchtowers effectively <laughs> uh, and uh, so you know that that's another element of ritual too depending on tradition that those beliefs may actually change um, and, you know, sometimes, too, you know, traditions uh, change the, what you'll be doing in circle or how you call it. And, you know, it's very easy to go from one circle to another and realize that maybe there are some things that are familiar, but things may be completely different. And that is the way of it with different traditions. You know, they're not interchangeable. They all do things for, for very different reasons. And therefore, it may not actually be the, the same way that somebody else is, is doing it. Um, just even like when I was mentioning like the asperging with the salt and the water, the incense itself really is fire and air. So you could have very limited things that are, that are on your, your altar. Um, 
Yeah, another thing is too is that you know I have a working altar at, at home, and that has usually the tools that I would need to to do a ritual. Not all of them are are present at any given time. You know, I might have specific things for for certain reasons. I usually will have a chalice, the athami, a libation bowl, the candles, maybe some deity representations. Uh, might have the the elements, you know, the the incense and all that set up already. But I usually don't have much beyond that because, you know, the, the circle that I might have to do might change. I never know, let's say, I might actually get a effectively a prayer request and I will actually hold my own personal circle for someone for, say, healing, so, you know, or maybe protection, something to, to help somebody with. So, you know, th- these are very real reasons why we do things. It's not that we, we want to mess with the forces of the universe. We're asking for very positive change to occur. Um, Another thing that people have are shrines. Shrines are not the same as as having something like a working altar. I have a shrine tree in, and it is covered with nothing but horses. (laughs) Horses and birds. That's all there is. And, you know, I will put little things on the altar. Things may be libations. They might be offerings. I, uh, although it's not set up right now, I have to, uh, fix it. It, it, it had some issues. I have a little ancestral altar, you know, a little shrine. And, you know, I, I take people that have passed on and, you know, I'll put their photo or maybe something that they've given me and sometimes a pet and, and actually even a little bit of, of, of horse mane from Holly, the, the very first horse that I ever rode that was my aunt's. It sits up on there too. So, you know, we all have different ways of, of honoring, you know, deity or maybe even ancestors. And this can also depend on tradition, too, and people's personal practices. But if they have a shrine, you know, that is not the same as having something like a working altar, which is set up to be a, a part of ritual. Mm-hmm. So, and the altar itself actually is a sacred portion, too. Um, traditionally, it's actually made without uh, any metal at all, if you can. Most certainly not the the tabletop itself, because you know that's actually uh, conductive, if you will. So I have a a very nice, you know, for myself, a, an old Victorian table that I use as as my altar stand, which has this lovely little bottom shelf underneath that I, after you throw the tablecloth on, you can't see it. And I can put the cakes there, I can put the incense there, anything else I need for ritual is under there. So, you know, that again, that's something that, that's personal. That's, that's a preference, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but truly, it could be anywhere. Don't have to have an altar to, to hold a uh, ceremony. Um, you know, that could be anywhere. You know, for the most part, we like to do things out in the woods, underneath the moonlight, under the stars, you know. Um, because, the, you know, these are the forces of nature that we connect with. And so we, we don't see ourselves as being removed from that. We see ourselves as being a part of that. We are just, you know, the, the microcosm within the macrocosm. So, <laughs> and so is the altar. So, do you have anything else you would like to add? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think we covered all. Well, I have one little thing. Yeah. We talked about circle and, and, and we have a circle, we have a circle, but we never said why. Was the, explain the purpose quickly, like what a circle oh, casting is. casting a circle? Yes, yes. But why there's a circle? Oh, well, there's a circle because we need to go between the worlds to, to do our magical work. And it's, it's set up in such a way as that it's a between times, uh, between places, uh, between everything. Yes. And, you know, it's that nexus, that, that crossroads, um, where everything meets is really that, what we're aiming for when we actually do a circle. And it's, it's even a, a form of protection as well, that, you know, things are only invited in that we wish to be there. Anything else is, is cast out. So, you know, that's one of the many reasons why we, we purify within the circle. It's not just purification of the self, it's also purification of the space. And we're very particular on, on what we invite in. Yes. So, um, because again, it's, it's a sacred act, you know, um, lower spirit, you know, maybe things like ghosts, we wouldn't invite into circle necessarily. (laughs) 
you know, they, these aren't forces that we want to work with. We, we deliberately do everything in, in certain ways. Um, and then that's the reason why you sweep, too, to yes. sweep so it's only pure inside the circle. Yes, anything that anybody may have dragged in with them. And even for the same reason, that's the reason. You sweep the altar sometimes. Well, you go in a circle barefoot. Yes. You know, and, and that's the same thing, too. It's, it's Again, it's another sacred act, and we don't want to drag things into circle that we've been walking around in all day either. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it, it's all about the sacredness of what we're doing. Um, so I think that we're pretty much at the end of our little talk. If you uh, want to find out more, go to pantheontemple.org. And uh, you might want to see some of the information that we have there. There are links, too, to the, the Wiccan Church of Canada website and all that. So you can find out a little bit more about what we do. So thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, we'll see you next week. Till then, uh, be good to, to the people that you love. And blessed be. Keepers of the Flame is produced by the Pantheon Temple. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider donating to the Pantheon Temple. We are a 501c3 nonprofit temple and the first Wiccan and Pagan temple in the state of Connecticut. It is our dream to someday have land in a building. Please help us achieve this goal. And for more information about us and our events, please go to our website at www.pantheontemple.org. Please visit PaganOdyssey.com for Beltane Pagan Odyssey Festival. Connecticut's oldest and original pagan festival by the Pantheon Temple. And please visit Keepers of the Flame at our new website at www.keepersoftheflametv.com. Really? Buzz, what's up, man? You left some leaves burning out here. Yeah, I, I just, I, there was a, I had, just came in just for a second. Come on, man. If it's too hot to touch, it's too hot to leave. You could torch the whole neighborhood. It's a good point there, smoke. Key. Nine out of ten wildfires are caused by humans. Only you can prevent wildfires. With a dozen and swaying at a feverish pace Take me away on a mystical ride Moving through the veil to the other side Fill me up with the spirit songs of power and love's alive Take me down through the seven gates Where I'll cast my being to the hands of fate Take me down to the dragon's lair Where myth and legend cry the air Let me rise on the messenger's wings Let me see what the future brings Fill me up with the spirit Songs of power and love's alive. Take me down where the pagans go, where the fires are high and the candles glow. Take me down to the magical place where they're dancing and swaying at a feverish pace. Take me away on a mystical ride, moving through the veil to the other side. Fill me up with spirit songs of power and love's alive.